Okay, ladies, if you've been listening to me for a while, you've heard me probably mention at some point in time that I was an alcoholic uh, for many years. I started drinking at the ripe old age of 13 years old is when I had my first cocktail. And it really catapulted me into a couple decades of uh, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, and it did not do me any favors. It is something that I feel very passionate about, especially when it comes to working with women and their health, because it's the one thing that I feel that a lot of women are not willing to really look at or not really knowing even how to begin getting control of their drinking. So when I heard about my guest today and I went to her website, I got super excited because I loved everything that she had to say just from reading her website. Sarah is a certified women's health and well-being coach and accredited gray area drinking coach and a keynote speaker sharing her journey to sobriety and impact of alcohol on mental health to global audiences. After developing what she describes as a dysfunctional relationship with alcohol, Sarah made the decision to remove alcohol from her life in early 2019 and has never looked back. She now works with women across the globe, guiding them from feeling lost, stuck, and out of control, something she fully understands herself, as do I, to a healthier and happier way of living. So thank you so much for being here, Sarah, all the way across the world. I know from sunny Australia, we were just laughing about the fact that you're coming into winter now and you've got snow outside and we're coming into summer and I'm having to get my air con service to make sure that we can survive the heat of the summer. So yes. It's, <laughs> and um... I've got my heater beside me right now and uh, my sweatpants on <laughs> because I'm so cold. <laughs> And it's morning for her the next day and it's evening for me. So we're like, she's getting her kids off to school. My kids are coming home from school. So, but we made it happen. And I wanted to make this happen, Sarah, because I, like I said before, I really liked what I immediately saw on your website. And I've had a lot of different speakers that have come and gone through the years that have talking about drinking, but this whole idea of this gray area drinking, which we're going to you know, we're going to talk about what that means, but I really just want to start though, first and foremost, of course, with your story of alcoholism. Um, I have shared my story on a podcast a long time ago that's called Alcohol, Is It Worth It? So I'll link to that in the show notes, everybody. So if you haven't listened to that, I would go listen to it. It was actually one of my most downloaded podcasts that I've done. And I share my own personal journey um, with the struggle of alcoholism. So uh, please take it away, Sarah. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for that introduction. So I think the main thing to say for me is that um, I didn't and have never at any stage identified with being an alcoholic. And, and I think that that's really important because I think a lot of people might hear that term and the stereotype of an alcoholic is someone who's homeless, someone who's drinking in the morning with shaking hands and they can't get through the day without alcohol. And I think that's where that term can actually be quite detrimental because if you don't fall into that category, then you go, oh, well, then I'm okay because I don't drink in the morning and I don't drink every single day and I haven't lost my home and I haven't lost my relationship. I'm still functioning. I still go to work every day. So what am I? And that was why I stayed stuck in gray area drinking for so long because I didn't, I hadn't heard of gray area drinking mm -hmm. and I didn't understand what I was. And so I'll share with you now what that looked like for me so that for you and for your listeners, it's really important to know that that we can have spectrums of a relationship with alcohol that is dysfunctional, but still not classify ourselves as being that that alcoholic in the old fashioned stereotypical view of, of what that looks like. I was very similar to you. I started drinking at such a young age. I grew up in the north of England. And that rite of passage at 14, 15 years old was to fill up the soda stream bottle with whatever you could find in the parents' drinks cabinet, yes. make a oh, concoction yes. of like Southern Comfort, Cinzano, <laughs> Martini, Bacardi, Malibu, mix oh, them gosh. all together, put a bit of Coke on top. 
and take it down the local park where we would all yes. share it. Oh my and God, like you are literally like, telling my story right now. <laughs> yeah, so we would all do that. We would get drunk, we would kiss the local boys and then we would go home, feel like crap and do it all again the next day. And, and that was just that rite of passage at that era in the 80s and the 90s of teenage kind of discovering who we were. It never even occurred to me that I wouldn't drink. It was just, when would I drink? Um, I'd grown up in a house where my dad drank heavily. Um, there was alcoholism mm-hmm. in my dad's side of the family. And I'd always seen my parents, every time they socialized, it was always with alcohol. There were lots of parties at our house, dinner parties. There was always alcohol there. So for me, it was just an obvious choice was that I would drink. And looking back now, I can see I'd grown up, um, by the time I was 13, I'd been to five different schools. And I think that did play a part in me drinking and loving drinking because I had been so used to being the new girl, having to always fit in, having to kind of adapt myself to the surroundings of the new school that I was at and, and try and make new friends. And what I loved immediately about alcohol was I fast tracked that feeling of closeness with people because you know, after a few drinks, when you're like, oh my God, you're, you're my, my best, best friend. friend. Yeah. And you're telling all your secrets and you're like, I'm so glad I met you. And that was all I wanted because as a young girl who'd moved around a lot, I just wanted friends. I wanted to feel accepted. I wanted to be included. And I learned very quickly that when I drank with people, I got that really quickly. So alcohol became something that was my way of fast tracking friendship. It was a way of creating friendships. It was a way of creating connections. And I was automatically drawn to other people that liked drinking as much as I did. So of course, you know, through my teenage years, there was drugs, there was alcohol um, and all of it. There was a lot of problems going on at home with my mum and dad. And that was my escapism. That was the way that I made friends, felt, felt safe, felt included, felt like a group, which was what I've craved for such a long time. So then went to uni, again, you start uni, the freshers week, you just get smashed for a week and make friends and sleep around and all of those things that kind of happen as that initiation into like university and leaving home. And, and But at the time I never thought my drinking was problematic. I just drank a lot and I made sure that I hung out with other people that drank a lot so that my drinking didn't feel abnormal or didn't in any way look like it was problematic. And it was also an era in the 90s of girl power, sex in the city. We can, you know, it was sophisticated to to drink alcohol and to match the boys pint for pint. I moved to London and, you know, we were all channeling our inner Samantha. We were drinking Cosmopolitan, sleeping around, thinking we had it all. And, And that was kind of what lots of young women of my age were doing at that time. And none of us looked at our drinking and thought, oh, that's not good, that's not healthy, that's not a problem. Like No one was talking about the impact Mm. that alcohol had in any kind of detrimental way. Um, Fast forward a few years and I had met my husband, a massive drinker. We were um, lots of recreational drugs. We were partying all the time. You know, it was a full on hedonistic lifestyle. We had no kids, we had good money. We would have weekends in, you know, the South of France, weekends in New York. We would do whatever we wanted. And... I had a really good job. And so all of those things were just kind of going along as as, as they um, as I wanted it to. For me, the problem came, um, well, first of all, it took me a long time to conceive um, and to get pregnant because no shit, it turns out that when you're drinking shitloads and doing loads of recreational drugs, your body is kind of like, yeah, right, maybe, yeah, I don't want you to get pregnant. Um, I was also really stressed. I was burning the candle at both ends, partying, you know, that would think nothing of getting home at 2 a.m. and being on the tube at 7 a.m. on the way to work, you know, clutching my kind of burger or whatever it was that was going to get me through the hangover and then doing it all again. And we eventually did get pregnant through fertility treatment and I stopped everything. Like it, it wasn't difficult for me to stop. I didn't crave alcohol. I was desperate to have a baby. But when it all became problematic for me was we made the decision to move to Australia. And so we moved to Australia with William when he was 10 months old. And I got pregnant again straight away because it turns out when you haven't been drinking for a year and your body has done it before, it knows what to do. And so then all of a sudden I had two under two. I had no family. I had no friends. I had no job. 
I had a husband who was out setting up a business in a new country, so was working really long hours. And I was really lonely and I was really homesick. And I started drinking in a way that was to soothe those emotions. Now, I didn't recognize that at the time. At the time, it was, you know, mummy wine culture. You deserve it. Have a wine at the end of the day. You know, all of those things. But the difficult thing for me was also I would only made friends through alcohol. And all of a sudden, when we first got to Australia, I was pregnant. And so I didn't know how to make friends without alcohol. I was trying, but it was really didn't come naturally to me because that was how I fast tracked friendship. That was how I created bonds with people. So I became really withdrawn because I was like, why aren't I making friends quickly? Why? This is really unusual for me. I'm someone that makes friends really quickly. But of course, I've done it with alcohol. And now because right. I was pregnant, I wasn't drinking. So I felt then I thought, well, there's something wrong with me. Why don't people like me? But of course, it just takes a while to build a friendship without alcohol. But I've never done that before. So I didn't actually know that it just takes a while of seeing someone at baby swimming and saying hi and having a chat and then seeing them the next week. And, and, and so it develops. I was like trying to thrust my phone number on women the first time I met them because I didn't know how else to do it. And I think they were all like, who is this weird English girl that is like trying to be my best friend within five minutes? But I just didn't know any other way, right? And I was so lonely and I was so homesick. And so that was when by five o'clock every day, I would hear my husband's truck pull into the driveway and I would take his children out to him. We had a newborn, we had a toddler and I'd say, take your kids. And I'd just be stood there with tears streaming down my face. Mm -hmm. And I would go back inside and I would open my wine and I would sit in the garden and I would smoke cigarettes and I would sit on my own and then I felt better. Mm -hmm. And so then that neural pathway became really strong of when I feel lonely, when I feel sad, when I feel homesick, I must drink wine because that makes those feelings go away. Yeah. And that's a pretty strong neural pathway to build um, when you're feeling those emotions quite regularly. So then, yes. of course, the drinking becomes daily. It becomes habitual. It becomes something that you very quickly learn. It makes those uncomfortable emotions go away, which was all as humans that we want. Right. We've never yeah. been taught that it's OK to have an uncomfortable emotion to sit with it. It was just like, shit, what's the first thing I can do to not feel this way anymore? And alcohol you didn't have to tell me twice that I could have that glass of wine at five o'clock and I deserved it. And, you know, all of the mum wine culture, my mum drinks wine because I wine and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. I was just like, yeah, just give it to me. I deserve it. I deserve it. Um, then fast forward a few years and drinking was, i have made some friends, um, lots of you know quite big drinkers in the way that gray area drinkers drink generally will try and surround themselves with other drinkers because again it's you don't feel like you're drinking abnormally but I was starting to question my drinking I was starting to wonder like on a Saturday night I would have quite a few Sunday I remember I would be counting down the hours until it was okay to have a drink because yeah. that was the first thing that I could think of that would take away the hangover and couple of things had happened and by 2017 I was like yeah I think I need to take a break I'd, I'd had a big boozy party I'd been to I'd fallen over I'd smashed my face I had another one where I'd gone out to um, a friend's birthday we'd started at 12 we finished at 2 a.m 14 hours of drinking champagne and at 7 a.m I woke to my son standing at the end of my bed in his full cricket outfit going mum mum wake up you need to take me to cricket and I couldn't because I was still over the limit and mm -hmm. I couldn't drive my son to his favorite thing in the world at 7am on a Sunday morning because I was still pissed yeah and that was a wake-up call to me and on top of this my anxiety had started to go through the roof because it turns out that alcohol is quite a big trigger for anxiety and I've never been an anxious person and I was just overthinking everything I would lie in bed worrying about what I'd said what I'd done like questioning myself I'd gone to my GP and I said I'm an absolute mess I'm I'm a shell of the person that I was and at no point did she ask me how much I was drinking and yet happily wrote me a prescription for anti-anxiety tablets uh, which I didn't take and I said 
I'm going to take a break from alcohol. And I set out to do 21 days. And I said, I'm just going to do three weeks off because they say it takes 21 days to, to de- you know, form the new cleanse, habit, yeah. form the new habit, cleanse your liver, all of those oh, right. things. I'll just do a detox. So I did 21 days and I was like, oh my God, I feel amazing. I'm going to keep going. And so, of course, the first week was pretty awful. But after that, it was like, oh, this is what it's like to wake up every morning without a hangover. This is what it's like to get eight hours solid sleep and not wake up with a dry mouth and a racing heart at 3 a.m. This is what it's like to feel energized and happy and positive and gifted every single day. And I was like, I want more of this. So I kept going and I got to 100 days. And then I was like, but I can't not drink again because that would be weird because I'm Sarah the party girl, but it's fine. I've done a hundred days. So now I'm fixed. I clearly don't have a problem because people who have a problem can't take a hundred days off. So I'm fine. It's all okay. I'll go back to drinking and now I'll be a normal drinker and I'll just be able to have one or two. (laughs) And doesn't quite work like that. So within two weeks, I was back to drinking the same level as before. Mm -hmm. Um, And so what happened for me was two years then between 2017 and 2019 of taking breaks, going back to drinking, trying to moderate, never being able to moderate, going back to fully taking a break, going back to drinking. And I was just on this merry-go-round, but I had just never forgotten how good I felt when I didn't drink. And it was like, why do I keep going back to the thing that makes everything in my life worse when I know when I remove it? I feel better, I lose weight, my skin's glowing, I'm so much more positive, my relationships are better. Why do I keep going back to the thing? And I had to have a good hard look at all of the reasons behind that. And then April 2019, and I just knew, I knew that was gonna be it and that would be forever. So I set the date in, I think it was like the beginning of March. And I set the date for the end of April after a friend's 40th. And I went to that 40th thinking, oh, this is my last hurrah. I'm going to get absolutely smashed. I had my hair and makeup done. I was like, this is it. I'm going out with a bang. And I went home at 10 o'clock after two drinks. And <gasps> I just knew I was done. Ooh, that gives me shivers. <laughs> I just knew that, that on the other side of that night was the start of the rest of my life. Wow. Oh my gosh. That does really give me shivers. That's That's amazing. Yeah unfortunately, I don't think it happens that way for most people. I would say that I, I, so much of your story I can relate with. Oh my goodness. And mine was, I, it was, took me years of saying to myself, I don't want to drink anymore. But yet being that all of my friends drank, I was a bartender for many years. I was in the industry. And so to go out and be social, it meant I had to drink. And it was going starting to go against my intuition and what I really wanted to be doing, but I didn't have the tools or the means to go, that's it. And until I had a boyfriend that was emotionally violent when he drank, like he, he would just be, it was terrible. He would lose all control of himself and he would come at me, not physically, but mentally. And it was so bad that I said to him, why don't we stop drinking for a while? And we, the same thing, it was going to be one month, 30 days. And that was it. And at the end of the 30 days, same as you, I felt so good that I was like, I don't, I don't want to go back to it. Like I can't. And so I decided I was going to keep it going for a while. And he went back to the drinking. I eventually lost, you know, I broke up with him. Thank goodness. But Then it was the same as you, where I kind of did this back and forth for a bit because I still didn't know how do I not drink around all of these people that are drinkers and how do I still have friends? And it's so, this is before I even had kids. And then I had my daughter and that really kind of catapulted me into deciding that that was it. I'm done. And I pretty much was, I think I had a couple more nights in there, but as time went on, same thing as you, where I was like, I don't want to be compromised anymore. And that became more important to me was I just didn't want to feel altered the next day. I didn't, I wanted to feel my best and I never did if I was drinking, but I don't think that most, 
I think that a lot of women, way more than I thought originally, have that voice that's going on like I had in the back of the head and that you had that was like, I don't want to be doing this anymore. But yet you still go out and you still do it every night. When because you agree? don't know any other way. There's so many women. I did an article that went into an online Australian publication last year where I shared my grey area drinking story. 8,000 women reached out to me. Oh, my gosh. And, and every single one said, you just told my story. Aww. Like There are so many women sitting in silence that have that voice that's going... Mm you're not your drinking's not good you're using this you shouldn't be drinking this much you need to take a break but the problem for so many people is moderation isn't an option but Mm -hmm. stopping forever feels so big and so hard and so scary so you just go right I've just got to take a break and this is what so many this is gray area drinking we take a break and we go right okay everything's all right now now I'll be able to moderate go back to drinking realize moderation isn't going to happen the drinking creeps up, then once again, we reach a point where it's just too much. It's too, it's it's taking too much from us. So then we take another break. And I was just stuck in that cycle for two years. But I don't regret that because it was from being in that cycle for two years that it made me realize I can never moderate. I'm never going to be able to moderate. So that's not an option for me. So there's only two options instead of three. And one is I carry on drinking at the level that I am, which is harming my mental health, my physical health, my relationships, my self-esteem, all of those things. Or I give this a really good go. And I didn't say to anyone, oh, I'm doing it forever. I said, I'm going to do a year because I've never done a year. So I always said, this is it. I'm just going to do the year and see how it is. Um, But I think I knew deep down, like, because nothing was ever going to change. I had tried for two years moderation and moderation was just not in me. I would always rather have none than have one because I was like, who are these people that only want one? I never wanted one. I loved getting drunk. Yes. And so, you know, like, so in the end, it was just the easier option was to take it off the table and go nap. Yeah. But how sad is it? that we have to put a time frame on it to justify it to other people. I just had this conversation with my hairdresser and she was like, we're doing sober uh, October. And she said, you know, and God, she said, people have such a hard time with it. And she said, you know, I have to tell them it's just for October so that yeah. people don't get upset with me that I'm not drinking. And I was like, yeah, but how sad is that, that you have to put, to put a time frame on it to justify why you're not drinking to other people. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's the problem with alcohol in our society. And I, so much of the coaching I do is with my ladies around how they cope with either a partner that is, I've got a client whose partner said to her, if you carry on not drinking, our relationship will be over. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I've got clients who basically said, I I feel like I have to go back to drinking because it's not fair on my friends if I'm not drinking. Yeah. And I'm like, are they really your friends? If that's how you feel. But for so many of us, it's so ingrained that that's what we do to socialize, to spend time together. That if, and because most of us have developed some level of a relationship with alcohol, whatever that might look like, that we then feel threatened by someone who's not drinking. Like I would avoid people. If someone said they weren't drinking, I was like, oh my God, we cannot be friends. I'm just staying far away from you. Right. Cause it shines a spotlight on us that we're drinking and it's like, oh, we don't like that. I remember my husband saying to me in Las Vegas of all places, like we were sitting there and we're drinking. And at that point I had been like seriously cutting down and And I remember him saying to me, see, this is, I love this. I love when you drink with me, we have so much fun. And I was like, I thought about that. And it was like a month later and he said something again. And I said, look, I said, have I ever bugged you about the amount that you drink? And he said, no, never. I said, so please give me the same respect and do not bother me that I don't drink. And he's never said a word since. So yeah, but very challenging when your people, some people's relationships with their partner are based around the the drink. That's when they have fun. That's what, you know, okay, let's go out for some wine. It's romance. It's like vacation time. Absolutely. And my husband and I ended up in couples therapy because the the ritual of connection which had always been he comes home from work opens a beer 
open the wine, we go and sit down outside and well, we stopped doing that because we weren't drinking alcohol together. And so we kind of just started to go further and further apart. We stopped connecting. We stopped sharing. My husband um, finds it much easier to talk about things after he's had a couple of drinks. And so but that just wasn't happening. And so we ended up in a, a situation where it was like, God, we don't even talk anymore. Who even are we? And so um, but couples therapy massively helped us to just work through that. And so and I, you know, I very openly share with my ladies that it's, it will change your relationship. Of course it does. Um, yeah. but that's not a reason not to do it. Yeah. Does, did he quit drinking? He did. Yeah. Eventually. So after watching me go through those two years, um, he then quit, um, around the same time as I did. So three and a half years. Oh, that's amazing. My husband did too. And then he tried to go back to moderation and same thing, slippery slope. We just had the conversation about it the other day and he, he sees it. He's like, yeah, you're right. It's like, you know, and he's, he's by all means, he's the gray area, just like we were. And that's, let's talk about that part, which is we all think that we're okay because I thought I didn't, wouldn't have said I was an alcoholic. No yeah. way. And even sometimes when I say that to people, I kind of feel like I'm false almost, like I'm lying about what I what problem I had because I wasn't somebody that had to drink all day long with a yeah. drinking like and that was shaking if I didn't get my drink. Yeah. And so, but looking back, like you, I had one and it was a runaway train. I couldn't wait to have the drink at that hour. Yeah like happy yeah. hour. And I was doing it sometimes every single night for months on end, I would be drinking for eight hours a night or whatever, because I was in that industry of party party. Yeah. So yeah, that was, I was an alcoholic. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And we, and, and it's important that we recognize that there is this spectrum now, because in the UK, the doctors don't even use the term alcoholic. Now they call the alcohol use disorder. And it's a spectrum. And the way I think about gray area drinking is if you think of a scale of one to 10 and one being someone who never drinks or has a glass of champagne at a wedding. And other than that, alcohol doesn't feature in their life. And 10 is the end stage physical addicted alcoholic who needs to have medical support to stop drinking. Because it's really important to note here that there are only three substances in the world that the human body can die from withdrawal from. And alcohol is one of them. And so we've got one and 10 there, but for me, the gray area is about a five to an eight on that scale. So we've passed the point where we're just drinking socially. We're just drinking every, you know, to, when we're out with friends, we've got to the point where we're using alcohol as some kind of crutch. We're using it to escape an emotion. We're using it to manage stress and unwind. If we've got to the point that we're making rules around our drinking, I had so many rules. I'm not allowed to drink on a Monday and Tuesday. I'm not allowed to drink before five o'clock. I can't drink at the weekend unless it's after lunch or with food, you know, blah, 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 blah. But I would always break them. And But if people that don't have a problem with alcohol don't make rules around their drinking. Like if you're at the point where you're making rules, then you've probably got a problem. Yeah. And I think it's also really important when you talk about the spectrum to not judge the people that are in the, that far end of that spectrum. I think there's still so much judgment and it's, you know, you're, you're, we want you, everybody's like, I want you all to drink with me, but the minute you get to the end of that spectrum, now you've got a problem. Now you're not good. Now you're less than- Right. And it's like, no, there's, we should not have any judgment here that yeah. just because that person is not a maybe great at a five and because they're at a 10, they are no less than you. It's their, it's their physiology. It's what's the, what's driving them to get to that point. And don't think that you can't get there. That's what Absolutely. I Absolutely. Like, yeah. like people who are a 10 were a five one day. You right? know, like they, yes. they, they get that. And we've got to remember that there are in alcohol features in the top five most addictive substances on the planet so when your body becomes addicted to alcohol that's not your fault like that it's addictive we yeah. don't blame people when they get addicted to uh, other things but alcohol is that that drug that you are 
criticized for not taking it but yeah. you're also criticized if you take it too much and become addicted to it even though it's highly addicted so you must but this is where the big alcohol messaging from governments and everything is so corrupt because it's all drink responsibly drink in moderation you wouldn't say to someone smoke in moderation or inject your heroin in in moderation but with alcohol because the government let's get so much bloody tax from it then of course they, they want to keep selling it but i read something the other day that said um, in the UK, if everyone drank at the recommended limit of alcohol, which I think is about 12 to 14 units a week, the alcohol industry would, would go bust. It would lose billions and billions a year. They don't want people to drink in moderation, right. but they have to be looking like they're trying to kind of encourage that. But it's the subliminal messaging. It's absolutely everywhere. You watch a Netflix show. And you watch the woman come home from work after a hard day, reach, open the fridge, pour a glass of wine, and oh, there Or I her tumbler less. of scotch, which I'm like, oh, give me a break. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she's slim and beautiful, and she's got her, you know, half a bottle of a scotch down, and you're going, really? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's glamorized. Yeah. Glamorized everywhere we look. You can't watch a TV show right now with women in it that are not drinking. It's it's everywhere we look. So yeah. all of that said, <laughs> that makes it extremely challenging to stop. Um, what are some steps that women can take that are right in the middle of this, that are all going to right now, oh, that's me, that's me, that's me. How do I even begin getting out of this? Yeah. So I think, recognizing that you want to change it is mm -hmm. the first step so yeah. acknowledging and then to maybe start with just starting to recognize how much are you actually drinking because I was in absolute denial like I was like yes. I have one to two glasses my glasses were the size of a bucket you know like <laughs> I could justify yeah. that that was you know I don't drink that much so start to recognize you know how much are you drinking and be be, be curious about that um, secondly, I think joining a community is the number one thing that changed everything for me because I was surrounded by people that were promoting alcohol, drinking alcohol, thinking that you couldn't socialize without alcohol. And what do they say? That you're the sum of the five people that you spend the most time with. So mm -hmm. starting to join a community, I have um, a couple of uh, Facebook communities that are incredibly supportive for sober curious women to come in and to see people, you know, sharing what their lives have been like since they've gone alcohol free and that type of thing. So joining that community and starting to just watch and listen to other people who start telling you it's not what we think it's going to be. I thought a life without alcohol would be boring. I'd never mm -hmm. have fun again. Same. I'd lose all my friends. I'd just be sat at home knitting on my own every night. And it has been anything but that. But Same. we need to start to, to be curious about that. I think reading the books, the books helped me massively. I'm an avid reader and there are some incredible books out there. You can go on my website and there's a free guide that you can download, which has got my favorite books, my favorite podcasts and all of the resources that really helped me in the early days. And then I think commit to, to doing 30 days off. Don't say it's going to be forever. Don't, you don't even have to think that far. Just see it as an experiment of starting yeah. to go, okay, Take 30 days off. And there is never a good time, by the way. There will always be a little voice that's going, oh, but you've got that party. You've got that birthday. You've got that wedding. Whatever it is. Um, I run challenges four times a year. And I find that is, I mean, that's now seen thousands of women change their relationship with alcohol because doing it alongside others makes such a difference. And so I will have one running in January after the Christmas period, get that over and done with. And then for those that, that want to do it, it's always like the biggest challenge that I do. And the women just connect, they share, they support, they encourage each other. And it just makes it so much easier. So doing something like that. But what I do is I don't do it in a way of right, let's take a month off booze, hang on for dear life, count down the days. And so on day 31, we can go and get smashed. I do it completely differently. And it's what are we adding in if we're taking the alcohol out? Oh, because yes. that's the Thank trick Thank you, here. Sarah. Yes, yes. That is the heart of success with changing your relationship with alcohol. If all you do is take out the alcohol and keep everything else in your life the same, it is going to be so hard and you probably won't even make seven days. Yep. 
if you take out the alcohol, but you join a challenge or, or something along the lines of what I do or many other incredible women are running as well, you get the resources, the knowledge, the information and the learning of, well, instead of drinking alcohol, I can do this. In, you know, we've got to be making sure that we're changing things up. Like at the beginning for me, Friday nights were the absolute worst night for me. Like there was something about a Friday night that just needed alcohol. Mm -hmm. And so I used, I signed up to a gym class that was 5 p.m. every Friday. I committed, I paid up front. I said, whatever happens, I will be at this class every Friday at five o'clock. And that, you know, it's, it's starting to be intentional with recognizing what are the most difficult times going to be and what can I do instead? Absolutely. Thank you for saying that. It's, that's what I tell my ladies is you can't just take it away without replacing it with something because most women that I work with, they're drinking, if not every night, every other night or every weekend to, because it's how they justify relaxing. Like us women in, in this day and age, we value our worth on how much we're doing. So you know, my husband, he'll go out and be like, I'm going to go play golf for seven hours. See you later. And he has no problem doing that with his friends. Women, we have a very, very hard time doing that. We we don't go, oh, I'm just going to go, you know, hang and go do something I just love to do. That's not mothering or cleaning my house or cooking or working. We don't do that. We yeah. feel guilty. We don't take time for ourselves but we can justify the drink. It's acceptable to have that glass of wine. And it's then, then it's our time to relax. You know, it's like, that's what every woman says to me. Oh my gosh, I can't imagine not having a glass of wine at the end of the day. Like that is my treat yeah. for myself. So you got to replace that treat somehow. You can't just yeah. take it all away if you've got nothing to give to yourself. You know, I, lis I listened to something the other day that said, um, They've done studies and they've said men will mostly drink for to enhance a good mood or for socializing. And women are mostly drinking for oblivion. Aww. And doesn't that just make you so sad? But yeah. the thing about alcohol, Karen, is that we can drink our wine whilst we're unloading the dishwasher, cooking the dinner, That's getting it. the ironing ready. So we feel yep. like we're giving ourselves a reward, but we don't have to leave the kitchen. Yep. And that's what's so messed up about it. It's like, how do we encourage the ladies that we work with to, to to know that they deserve to take time away from the kitchen and that they can delegate and that they can you know they are justified in in wanting to do something that soothes and nourishes the nervous system without needing to drink wine yeah because like you like what happened with you where you got anxiety from the drink and yet you were probably then drinking every night to squash that anxiety and that's, yeah, the, that's the worst vicious circle, isn't it? The biggest myth about alcohol is that it soothes anxiety because what happens in the brain is we have um, a very, very, we have equilibrium, homeostasis, where all of the neurotransmitters in the brain are exactly at the level that the brain wants them to be in order to for us to operate and feel good. When we drink alcohol, we get a massive surge in what's called GABA. GABA is the neurotransmitter that makes us feel calm and relaxed. And interestingly, 80% of the women I work with are deficient in GABA. So of course they're turning to alcohol because their brain is not producing GABA themselves. So when I work with my clients and I discover that they're deficient in GABA, we've got a three-pronged approach to start rebuilding their GABA without needing to drink. So you get this massive surge of GABA when you drink. So that's why for that first 20 minutes, everything switches off. Your whole body starts to feel relaxed and calm and you go, ah. Oh. But here's what happens next. The brain despises this huge surge of a, a neurotransmitter that's out of alignment with the, with the others. So it releases the chemical cortisol because cortisol is the stress hormone that basically brings the GABA back in line. But the problem is that we don't want excess cortisol to be running around our body because that leaves us feeling more stressed and anxious. And the alcohol wears off, but the, the cortisol doesn't. So we're then left feeling more stressed and more anxious than we were before we even picked up the first drink. Oh my God. And my audience is very familiar with the word cortisol. So that's, yeah, that's crazy. I didn't know that about the GABA and drinking. Yeah, absolutely. And there was a study, um, I heard it on the Huberman podcast, and he said that people who drink, even if it's one to two glasses, three or four nights a week, have an increased baseline level of cortisol to people that don't drink at all. 
No way. And that they're and that people are deficient in GABA? Like you've you've they've tested that? Yeah. So I mean I test it. So I do one-on-ones with my clients and I do a neurotransmitter assessment, and 80% of my ladies are deficient in GABA, which makes sense because we're stressed and we're anxious and we're overwhelmed and we're busy and we've got so much going on. Um, but the problem as well is that when we're drinking regularly and consistently the brain almost goes on strike from producing its own GABA because it becomes reliant on the GABA surge that comes from drinking alcohol. No way. So your brain stops producing as much of it. So what I do with my clients, and this is what it talks about with what are we adding in when we're taking the alcohol out, the clients that work with me one-to-one, if they're deficient in GABA, then there's certain foods we can eat, there's supplements we can take and lifestyle activities we can do that start to rebuild our GABA stores naturally without needing to drink alcohol. Oh my gosh. I had no idea. This is all news to me. I mean, I'm very familiar with GABA and it's one of the things that as women age, uh, when we lose our progesterone, progesterone is reacts on the GABA receptors of the brain. And we see women that are going into menopause, start drinking more heavily And that would maybe explain partly why is that they start losing their GABA, their cortisol starts going up. We know that cortisol gets dysfunctional also as we age and it starts to go up. So we've got two things that are coming at us that are affecting our GABA. So no wonder women are turning more and more to the drink as they age. Absolutely. And then the other third part to that is we've got to talk about tolerance. But the the longer we've been drinking, the more adept our brain becomes at managing the response of the alcohol and not getting the same high from it. So we need more and more and more to get the high. So by the time women are in their mid 40s, early 40s, which is the generally that most of the ladies I work with are between 40 and 55. By the time we get to that point, we've been drinking for quite a long time. Our tolerance has gone up and it's not just one or two glasses anymore. I've got ladies who are happily drinking two bottles a night and still get up and functioning and going to work the next day and going to the gym and doing all the things and so but but of course the more you're drinking the worse you're going to feel the bigger the response in terms of cortisol and so we're just trapped in a vicious cycle and not you know not even just that what about the weight gain that it would cause yeah there are, in some bottles of wine there are 69 grams of sugar 69 did i heard that right oh my goodness 69 grams of sugar holy lightning (laughs) that's in one bottle it's in one bottle you're drinking 70 grams almost of sugar in a bottle that's crazy that's not that what is that like white rosés or something like that i guess yeah and like i think william porter alcohol explained he's the author of alcohol explained he did a post um recently that said that if you have a bottle of wine on the side of your meal it's like having a um a big mac on the side Oh, you, and you would never have a Big Mac on the side of your main meal. Like that's what it's doing to your body in terms of the sugar and calories. What about if, you know, because it's so popular right now to have these like super dry keto friendly wines or the no, um, the no sugar vodka. Uh, the salsas. Yes. yes. What about those? What do the, What are those doing for the sugar? It's really, really damaging because a study has been done that shows that people think they're drinking less alcohol when they're drinking lower sugar. Yeah. But they're not. They're it's drinking the- a high level of alcohol, but they've just got the lower sugar. And that's why, like, this is how corrupt big alcohol are that they've kind of gone oh we're losing some some drinkers because they don't want to put on weight so therefore we must create a product that has no sugar so they can still drink our products but but feel like they're not drinking sugar they've just they've just responded to the market to make sure we all keep drinking alcohol but that they're not going to lose their profit but does the alcohol because alcohol is a sugar is that still converting to sugar in the body once it gets in there even if there's no sugar added Yeah, it will do it. And and we know that the liver can't do its job properly if it's needing to convert alcohol. And then that goes on to have a massive impact on our hormones. That's why there's such a link between alcohol and breast cancer. Like they say now in Australia that 20% of breast cancer diagnoses are directly caused by alcohol. 
Oh yeah. That's really scary. Isn't it? I know I always say like women are super afraid to replace their estrogen in menopause because they're afraid it's going to give them breast cancer. And I'm like, that wine you're drinking every night raises your risk of breast cancer way more than that estrogen. So much more. So much more. And and a study has been done that's shown for every 10 grams of alcohol that we have, which is a small glass of wine, we increase our chance of breast cancer by between four and 13%. Wow. So you don't even, there is no safe amount of alcohol. No, there isn't. Is there? And yet we're being told, I remember Huberman, didn't he say something about that on the podcast about the people were people think that they're getting this health benefit by drinking wine and he said oh, like, gosh, no yeah. that he's like that's so false, <laughs> like, so false. to get the resveratrol benefits you'd have to drink yeah. so much wine that it would then counteract the whole benefit exactly thing. just go and have some blueberries right yeah <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, I can keep chatting to you all day long, but I know that um, I have to watch your time here because you've got another client. So where can people find you and what do you have? Because you said you've got a 30 day challenge, but what else do you offer for women that are looking to get help? Yeah, so loads of things. There's um my free Facebook community, which is called the Women's Wellbeing Collective. Come and hang with us join us we've got women from all over the world australia the uk america canada singapore um and it's a very welcome and um, welcoming and warm community uh instagram i'm always posting lots and lots of resources um and and benefits to removing alcohol so to get that inspiration and then i have a challenge that's going to be running in january so it will start around the 8th of january and that will be 30 days of support connection resources and everything you could possibly need in order to give yourself that that break from alcohol and then for anyone who wants to do a one-to-one session with me and do that neurotransmitter assessment and discover whether they're deficient in GABA simply send me an email off the website and we can set that up amazing well you're doing amazing work and I'm just I wish there was so many more of you out there spreading the word just like I wish there was so many more of me spreading the word about hormones because it's these, these things are not talked about enough in our world for women. And we need the support. We need the information and the education on it. I really think it's lacking, extremely lacking. Yeah. It. Yeah. It absolutely is. And and this is the, the thing about what you and I are doing is we're standing up and, and saying, this is not okay. And there needs yeah. to be more information. And in our little small corners of the world, doing what we can to educate, inform and empower women to make decisions for their health that allow them to to live their healthiest life. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. And I'm going to put all of those links in the show notes, you guys, so you can go join her Facebook group. If this is something that is hitting something in that self of yours (laughs) where you're going, "Mm, yeah, maybe it just even start with exploration, you know, just simply yeah. join the Facebook group and just see what's out there. You can stay quiet and hide in the corner and just watch what other people are posting. If that's all you have to do, if you've got any inkling of interest, I would really encourage you to take that first step. Yeah. I've got ladies who have been in the group for like 18 months and then they'll send me an email and go, I'm finally ready. And, and mm. I get it. Like it's, yeah. It's, oh, me too. Like it's a two mindset years. Shift. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's a mindset shift. Um, but if you're curious, come hang out in the group and, and meet some other curious women and see for yourself some of what they're saying, because it does start to to slowly, slowly shift your mindset and start yes. to go, ah, oh, maybe there is a life without alcohol that isn't what I thought it was going to be. Yeah, exactly. And changing those limiting beliefs, thinking that life's going to be over without it, because it's not. I will tell you firsthand, I've been sober for 15 years now. And I can't tell you that was one, I will tell you, it was one of the best things that I've ever done for my life, for my health, for my children. We didn't even get into that for my relationship. Everything benefited everything. So thank you, Sarah, very much for coming on the show. You're welcome. Maybe we need to do a part two at some point. I think we're going to have to. So much more. I know. Talk about (laughs) relationships, friendships, socializing, kids, like all of that. So yeah, let's do another one next year. Awesome. All right. Thanks Thanks, everyone. Thanks Karen.